Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you all for coming, and welcome to English's celebration of ASU's homecoming and to the 2019 Homecoming Awards. I am Kevin Sandler. I'm chair of the Homecoming Committee and associate professor in the Film and Media Studies program here in the Department of English. Uh, feel free to grab something to drink, something to eat anytime um, during this entire uh, program. Uh, just a little bit of background on the Homecoming Writing Awards. It was established 12 years ago in 2007 at the request of Randall McCraw Helms, now an emeritus professor in the Department of English. And the the awards are funded by donors to the department's scholarship account. And so we thank all the donors uh, for contributing to help make these awards possible. Um, this year, the awards are given into three categories, uh, poetry, uh, short story slash creative nonfiction, and scholarly essays. I want to thank this year's judges for all their hard work in reading all the submissions and choosing the winners. And I also want to thank uh, Bradley Irish for organizing the submission process. Uh, this contest always garners the most submissions of any of our awards and scholarships, and it's very difficult to choose the winners. So now let's hear them read from their work. So the first person who we will hear from is Alisa Lindsay, who is the winner for poetry. And her piece is Three Chicano Poems. Let's welcome her. All right, so I'm just going to read two of my poems for you guys today. Uh, the first one, tomorrow is my Nana's birthday. Today she calls me muñeca again, which translates to wrist or doll. The first time I told my mom and she said, well, you can't have hands without a wrist. There's no way, way to tell Nanita you're leaving without a touch on the back, grabbing her hands, a hug. And like a doll, a wrist, I am quiet while my Nana speaks like no one else is there with her. Sweet Spanish, no one can answer. I hold her hands, notice the brown spots on her wrists. Her eyes fill me blue cataract clouds. She looks out the window and sings a song I can't understand. Spanish as slang memory, forgotten notes, words lost in her throat. The first time, I found her cooking a meal with those lost eyes, pouring sugar into masa for tortillas, boiling the cutlery. She screamed at her hands for not closing into fists, tried to pound the masa dough with slapping palms, wrists covered in sugar flour. I touched her back gently, three taps so she knew it was me, led her to the table and turned off the stove, salvaged the dough and made two sweet pancakes, served them to her with a warm fork. Then she called me muñeca. Thank you. <laughs> All right, the song of Jorgina Navarrete. She remembers when her mother used to sing. She remembers her father used to sing along, songs of fields of ocean wind and Tamaulipas, songs of freedom, of occupation, songs of pounding masa into stone flat. She remembers her mother used to sing, remembers the pounding voice, her father, singing songs of going home a stranger. She remembers going home a stranger, remembers the echo of the door closing, echoes of their voices, their songs, and how it is so much louder in the empty. She remembers again what it means, remembers the word immigrant, how the word was the drumbeat of every song her mother sang, her father lighting candles if only to forget that word, how it haunted him. She remembers now the way her father looked before he left her, she remembers a brief hug, a kiss, the smell of aftershave she finds sometimes in dreams. She remembers his smile. She remembers the sad she hears when she remembers the word father, the word immigrant, bitter when said out loud. She remembers she used to sing along those songs she hears only in memories. Next up is the winner for scholarly essay, Thomas Bate. And the title of his piece, The Misery of Want, Why Violence Abounds in Wuthering Heights. Thomas. Uh, thanks very much. Well, I appear to have brought the weather with me. I do apologize. I'm from <laughs> London. I'm a sophomore. And this is my first essay I ever wrote at ASU. So it's gone pretty well. 
Um, I want to thank the judges. That's really kind. Um, I'm not going to read from it because it's quite boring and you know, no one wants to hear an essay. So I'll just roughly say what I, what I was arguing. So I said that in Wuthering Heights, the reason that the characters are incredibly violent, which they are, uh, is not as many sort of Marxist scholars have said, a kind of, uh, you know, dialectical uh, material reason. It's not for, in my opinion, a feminist reading that is about men oppressing women. I think that those are too reductive. I think there's a metaphysical reason for why the characters are so violent that derives from Arthur Schopenhauer's philosophy of pessimism. So I basically say that you know, in the 1850s, it was a very popular philosophy, romantic pessimism, uh, and you could see the effects of that on contemporaneous artworks um, like Moby Dick, you know, Captain Ahab goes completely mad, he's a romantic pessimist. And the other thing I do is any excuse to write about Wagner I will take, despite his you know, obvious drawbacks. Um, so I, I compare uh, Wagnerian opera to Wuthering Heights, you know, I compare uh, Kathy and Heathcliff to uh, uh, Sigmund and Sieglinde in uh, Die Valkyr, uh, and then I talk about the Leibstad at the end of um, Tristan, which in my opinion is the greatest moment in uh, art ever, you know, the, the final, you know, 10 minutes of, of Tristan, um, and how that, that's very similar to the characters in Wuthering Heights, because they love so much that they uh, hate, you know, they, they are so subdued and subordinated to their wills, to their passion, uh, that they cannot help but inflict horrible violence on people, and so I... That's basically the gist of the essay, and I say very little redemption is offered. You know, no, nobody, nobody, uh, nobody abandons their subordination to their wills. They're all completely hysterical, uh, highly romantic, with a capital H, and it all ends in tears, as Schopenhauer would have glibly and uh, smugly predicted. So, thanks very much. Uh, this means a lot. Thank you. And our last winner, and this is for the short story. Creative nonfiction category is Brenna Camping for Amber Eyed Raptors. Brenna. I'm going to read an excerpt from my piece. The morning is cloudy, humid, hot clouds from monsoon season. It smells like wet dirt outside. It's probably raining on the mountain. Ed had left the BB gun on my couch next to a small blood stain. It's black, the BB gun, and it looks like a pistol except for a little orange knob on the end of it. The owl's not in the tree yet since it's too early in the morning, around 10 a.m., and he's probably out hunting rats. I drink coffee, spiked with whiskey, and open my Bible. Sunday morning, I don't like church, but I like God. I read something in Proverbs. I'm a little hungover, so I'm not going to get into it much. And when I finish one coffee, I have another, each time a little more alcoholic than before. I have four coffees over the Bible, thinking about how Crystal... We'll be home for dinner, and I'll have to make her mac and cheese with hot dogs because it's her favorite. I'll have to tell her Bella's dead. I flip through Proverbs, reading something about wells and the marriage bed, until I hear a clacking of talons and flapping of wings, the monogamous owl on my, root, on my roof. I have another coffee and wait for him to fly to his perch. Five coffees later, shaky from the caffeine but calm from the liquor, I grab the shotgun when I hear him fly off to the mesquite tree. He's a pretty owl. Looks like he has ears. My daddy was pretty too all the way up until he died. Outside, I cross my front yard, swaying before the dirt road directly across from the wash and from the owl that's staring at me. I raise my gun, lots of cicadas out this morning. It might not even be morning anymore, actually. There's, light, there's lightning over the mountain and the thunder is quiet in the distance, but for once, the breeze is cold. The owl's eyes look at me over the orange cap, look at me across the dirt road. I shoot. Miss, miss so bad that the owl didn't even move. I shoot again, another miss. God damn it, I scream and shoot again, hitting the trees this time, but still not the target. The owl looks at me, feathers ruffled, but sitting still, like he knows I want to kill him, but won't be able to, like he's laughing at me, the way my daddy used to laugh at me when I'd hit him back, or how Tom laughed at me when I would say sorry. I shoot again, but the gun jams this time. The BB rattles in the body as I shake it, jingling the triggers inside. The owl, his eyes in my mind, he stares into me. It hurts so bad, so I grab the shotgun.